there is an intelligence of play, a rich and free exploration of relationship, nothing to justify or defend. The feel of a glove, a blade of grass, the sound of a great swing and a child's smile. There is an intelligence of play, a free and expansive exploration and relationship, trust and affection. It's a model of learning and performance we feel will light the way now and into the next century. We invite you to become a part of this vision, to discover and develop this quality in yourself. The intelligence of play, a new model for a new generation of children. Stuart Brown is a medical doctor, trained in general and internal medicine, psychiatry, and clinical research. His explorations of the universal and essential need for play resulted in a cover story for National Geographic and a PBS documentary. His interest in this field evolved from an intensive study of human violence, beginning with Charles Whitman, the Texas Tower sniper. One of the startling factors associated with this research was the absence of normal play in Whitman's childhood and that of convicted murderers and felon drunk drivers. I'd like to start by taking us in our mind's eye to a glade uh, about this time of year, uh, about the 8,000 foot level Glacier National Park, stream running alongside a, a glacier that's melting. Uh, I'm in a blind. I've been there for two nights and it's early morning and there is a family and troop of grizzly bears standing at the edge of this stream alongside this glacier. They have no awareness, I'm upwind, they have no awareness that I'm there. They're with a cameraman and lo and behold two of the juvenile male grizzly bears dig their paws into the glacier, make snowballs and start a snowball fight. Well that's one vignette of many I could give you lots of others that I've seen. I've seen uh, ravens uh, sliding down snow banks on their back. I've seen hippopotamuses doing back flips. Uh, I've been uh, in many a playground and seen uh, kids innovatively de devise new game after new game. The point I'm making is there's a phenomenon in nature called play that hasn't been appreciated properly and I'm going to try and place uh, play in a broad biological pers perspective and, and a little bit uh, focused on the human perspective. Uh, there's certain basics in biology. Uh, bacteria use energy. That's, they've been around for four or five billion years and, and uh, when a bacteria gets fairly smart uh, they fart oxygen. And when the oxygen got into the universe in sufficient amounts we had an oxygenated universe. Life changed our planet. Uh, when bacteria hooked up together and began to make uh, more complicated life forms, uh, it took a few billion years, we finally got something like a fish in the ocean or a lizard on land. And these very complicated creatures were cold-blooded and had a brain. They had a cortex, they had a midbrain, they had a brain stem. And they had neurotransmitters in their brains that are identical to ours. But they engaged in certain types of behavior. If you look closely at a fish, even though a fish will school up and a, and a fish will avoid a predator, its, its actions are stereotyped, repetitive, and can be gridded. Every time a fish does a certain thing, it mates or it, goes or it, goes, it avoids being eaten, it does so with a certain type of escape pattern. It may be very, very complicated, but it's stereotyped and repetitive. And if, we, if you live, as I do, uh, in the chaparral-laden hills of California and you take a hike, you'll see lizards all over the place. And if you're about to step on a lizard, their avoidance pattern is identical virtually every time you, you come close to them. And if you study a lizard well, they'll, they eat and forage in a specific stereotyped way. They're cold-blooded. The point I'm making is, is there can be extremely repetitive uh, behavior that is important and that is involved in survival but it's kind of boring and it's it's the behavior that's strictly related to making it in, in uh, as an animal in the planet and not either being eaten or being fried if you're in the sun and have to get out of, out of it if you're a cold-blooded creature. Well evolution and the wisdom of nature being what it is, uh, 
there's emergent complexity that seems to be a part of the universe. And after lizards uh, became dinosaurs, uh, it appears that they developed the ability to be warm-blooded. So part of what I'm giving you are the prerequisites for, to be able to play. Warm-bloodedness is one of them. Another one is the development of a very large brain, a cortex, that has some extra space in it for random activity. If you were to look at the uh, fundamental moves in play, they have certain characteristics. They're purposeless, they're pleasure-giving, they're fun, and they appear to enhance risk. They uh, put the player at risk of damage or death. Now, that's a curious thing to be retained in evolution, because most of us think that survival is based on not taking risk, on avoiding being eaten, on avoiding falling out of a tree if you're a chimpanzee. But play behavior becomes more uh, prevalent and is more associated with risk-taking the smarter and the more social the creature. Uh, and a certain other characteristic play, uh, there's a fundamental move in play, which is anti-gravity the ability, the desire to leap upward. That's the fundamental move. A dolphin goes up upward, a astronaut heads for the moon, uh, a mountain goat jumps upward. That, fun, that leap upward or the defying of gravity, and to some degree, if you're going to get metaphysical, the defying of time and space, is a fundamental move in play, all playing creatures. Just watch, that's, that's a basic move, and that, I'm going to, make some generalizations about solitary play and then get into social play. Leaping upward can be solitary. And if you observe uh, the, the best leapers, the mountain goats uh, in particular, sheep, wonderful leapers, you'll find they also add a twist and a turn to their play behavior, rotational locomotor play, ballet dancers. And these increasingly more complicated moves evoke pleasure and are the cerebellar stimulus, stimuli that uh, Jim was talking about. Add cerebellar stimulation and every safe, well-fed creature engages in these behaviors. It's as basic as breathing, as sleeping, as eating. This is not, it's not elective. If you're safe and well-fed, you'll play. Animals of, of increasing complexity also play with objects. Uh, they they use the environment to enhance their playfulness. Uh, you know, I can think of a number of things. Uh, sea lions play tug-of-war with kelp. Uh, that's an object. Uh, Kea parrots take a, a rock and bomb an unsuspecting victim. That's object <laughs> play. And think of us with our toys and the implications of toys and tools as an element that's, uh, that takes play beyond, uh, beyond the, simp the most simple animal forms. And you get some idea that this is also a fundamental aspect of being involved as a, as a creature in the wild with nature. Playing with objects is a natural phenomenon. And, and mastering the object-laden environment through play is a, is a basic fundamental aspect of play. And then there's social play. Uh, not all creatures are highly social, so this varies with the, with the type of, of creature. But since we're fairly uh, social in our natures, I'll describe some of the fundamentals of social play. Play chasing. And play chasing in the wild is not uh, like the French Connection movie where there's a chase going on and somebody gets killed or the, the traditional stories of chasing that are part of our, uh, our lore. There is, in, the tr in play chasing in the wild, a shifting between chaser and chasee. One chases, one, the other one chases. There's a reciprocity. There's a sharing of the phenomenon of power in the, cha in, in the chasing in nature. This is a fundamental element of play. Now, I have a, a good colleague friend by the name of Brian Sutton Smith, who's really a gifted observer of children's games, from the Maoris in New Zealand all the way up through Harlem Street Kids. A little bit like Fred, he understands uh, the essence of being human and hasn't lost, lost the ability to play, even though he's in his 70s. He has found that unless children learn how to play in unison, 
unsupervised and an unoverorganized way, they don't have the capacity to work in unison well as adults. Example, ring around the rosy, four-year-old kids holding hands. If you've ever, you know, I haven't done much of this, I've got four kids and it's hard for me to remember all this, but four, four-year-old, three-year-old kids trying to play Ring Around the Rosie, they will can't get their hands right and they're falling down early and, you know, they're stumbling around and they're having a heck of a time. They all look like they're having fun. And eventually they'll Ring Around the Rosie all fall down together. Unless a kid has learned that kind of living in, through, through play, they do not develop in a setting like this the ability to work in unison with each other. There's a fundamental given that's learned through spontaneous play and games that's extremely important. So you're getting the point. I think play is pretty significant and has relevance to uh, daily life, to intimacy, to communal life, to community, to the ability to follow rules. <laughs> It can occupy most of childhood's waking hours. And it may turn out that success in life depends on it. But one thing about it is obvious. It's fun. It doesn't really matter if you're a kitten, or a kid, or a kangaroo. The urge to play is built into your genes. And that's why we know it's important. Ah, to be young again to romp, to frolic, to cavort, to play tug of war and leapfrog and king of the hill. This behavior is almost universal among young, warm-blooded animals. The question is, why? Why all this apparently useless horsing around? Here's what we know. Play is fun. It gives pleasure. And that's why we do it. We know that play is essential to survival. The more you do it when you're young, the better off you'll be when you're older. need to play, like they did long ago, when the backyard was a wonderland and the day seemed to last forever. Mm -hmm.